Well, thank you very much to Dr. Tim Pelham, who's presenting today on an open source electromagnetics for sensors and communications talk. Thank you very much, Tim. Over to you. Thank you very much. So I'm just going to give a brief introduction in terms of my expertise is generally been in areas of antenna array design, electromagnetics for things like propagation and radar modeling. And I'm currently pursuing an intelligent community research fellowship for what I call spatial fingerprinting, uh, which concerns this uh, uh, charming radio node that you can see in the bottom right hand corner of the screen, um, allowing me to do direction finding and also kind of discern polarization of incoming signals. Uh, together with mapping from cameras to do spatial mapping and then pour that into Lyceum EM, which I'm going to go into in a minute, to create a channel model from the spatial model and use that together with the incoming signals to try and really get a good understanding of the location in the near environment of different signal sources within a network. And the idea is to make the RF domain less of an inherently open cyber attack surface but that's not really the focus of this particular seminar. So my original PhD research was in the field of next generation antenna arrays for complex systems. The idea being is that whether you have uh, more aerospace and defense orientated antenna arrays, or you're interested in satellite comms or the application of microwave medical imaging, uh, sometimes a planar antenna array just isn't going to cut it. And even if a planar antenna array is what you're interested in, if you're interested in its performance on a particular platform, it's still quite difficult to really get an understanding as to how that platform is going to affect the performance of that phase array. I mean, we talk about the difference between a near field environment and a far field environment, um, and we, we can try and isolate the characteristics of an antenna array within its local environment, but that still doesn't really help you when you're thinking about a larger platform, especially things that um, operate as a satellite or a building, trains, things like this. And so my initial research was to try and work out a way to allow for systems engineers like myself when I was at MBDA, or um, RF engineers to have a, a thorough understanding as to the performance implications of different design decisions right at the front end of a project before you'd really spec out how much money you were going to allocate for your development of the, the phased array, um, but yet still have good data on what the performance limitations could be. So you could have that trade space. And that is what eventually was developed into what I call Lycean EM. Um, the Lycean is a nod to the some of the earlier uh, universities, the Lyceans, um, which itself was a reference to far-sighted Apollo. Um, but the idea being is to take what you see or what you have at a very early stage and, and prophesy what the, the performance implications could be from a limited data set. And it has turned into a time and frequency domain channel model, uh, which is where it's got its most accurate uh, validation so far, but a, a very powerful tool for rapid virtual prototyping for antenna arrays. And I'm just going to go through uh, some of the, the workflows that motivated its development, and then some examples that you may well find interesting. So the idea behind Lycenium fundamentally was to allow you to take uh, that basic sort of information set of location on a platform, the platform geometry, uh, as well known as it is at the time, and the frequency of operation and say, is there something I can do with this data set at an early stage to say, the, what are the performance limitations of an antenna array of this size on this platform at this frequency? And of course, we can use Hanan's uh, formula for a, a planar array to predict the maximum bore site gain. Maybe we can use a, a some kind of understanding of uh, cos away from bore site to work out roughly what its directivity envelope might be. But what you can do with Lycenium is to extend that to an arbitrary antenna array of, or aperture of any kind, whether it's a conformal structure, whether it's a planar array, in the presence of that platform, you can evaluate what the maximum directivity could be at any particular direction. And obviously, this doesn't account for things like an antenna uh, 
um, arrangement, beamforming architectures, polarization, things like that. And for that, you will go to the next uh, level of detail of Lyceum EM. And the idea being is that you can take this information, which is uh, calculated in seconds on a desktop computer for most platforms and array sizes that I've encountered. And then you can use those numbers to evaluate the array design if the envelope is suitable for your applications. And so you have this ability to reduce the number of times you're going to go around in a development loop for your antenna array, because you can go into your design life um, cycle with the numbers on the performance, the optimum performance for that antenna array and its beamforming architecture in terms of phase shift or resolution, uh, what kind of, whether it's fully digital, analog, some hybrid, and have a good awareness of what the numbers should look like for an optimum antenna array. And the way this works is that the, the very kind of simplest way to evaluate an antenna array or aperture is just as an aperture itself. What kind of area is it projecting into the far field in a particular direction? And you can relate that to its uh, gain in that direction via Hanan's formula on a, for a planar array. Um, and that is what I would call aperture projection. And that is very fast on the order of less than a millisecond for anything but truly enormous antenna arrays. But it doesn't get you really as much information as I would like to design an array um, and, and make it really quite relatively straightforward. So the next step after that is aperture modeling, looking at the aperture itself in terms of a gridding of uh, idealized electric current sources. And then you can use that to predict the, the beam formed antenna pattern for that antenna array for a given polarization or uh, set of polarizations. And then you can go up another step further and you can say, well, for those element positions and polarizations, what's the effect of different beamforming architectures on the overall antenna array performance? And how is that going to affect uh, polarization purity in given directions? And what, in fact, can I do to really make the best of this antenna array design? Um, I'm just going to quickly go over and I suppose advertise for a figure of merit that I don't think has gotten the uh, recognition it deserves. We're, we're probably all familiar with directivity and gain, um, but I came across a figure of merit for antenna arrays called steering efficiency and steering efficiency product that I think is a really good metric for um, not just how steerable an antenna array is uh, related to its maximum boresight gain, but also how steerable and effective it is as an antenna array overall. Um, steering efficiency product is combining the percentage of the far field that that array can reach within 3 dBs of its maximum directivity with the aperture efficiency to give you a single number that you can use to evaluate any antenna array in terms of its, I would argue, its, its design for steerability. Um, the, the kind of the magic thing for me is that because you're relating it to its antenna aperture efficiency, um, it's irrespective of size. So you can have a very large antenna array that is very steerable. Um, but if it is very steerable because it's a conformal structure that is limiting its maximum directivity in any particular area, um, then that suffers on aperture efficiency, but does well on steering efficiency. So it isn't um, fooled by having an antenna array that's optimized for one, but not the other. And it allows you really to have this good understanding of the steerability versus um, produced gain for the size of any particular antenna array. Um, and this is just uh, quickly comparing it to what we might look at for maximum beam steering angle. So maximum beam steering angle, whether you're just using it in terms of radial sense or whether you're using it in terms of azimuth and elevation planes, it really gives you a relatively limited understanding as to how much of the far field you're actually able to reach. Um, and I think steering efficiency, given it's a percentage, uh, is a much more coherent way of evaluating the array's steering performance. Okay, so uh, this is kind of a look as to some of the reasons that I designed and then published open source Lycenium in the first place is for these two very different examples, um, you can, if this UAS up here, 
this red bit here is a conformal antenna array on the bow, which was um, conceived as an X-band radar. And you can see that with this location, somewhat naturally, you would implicitly assume that the maximum directivity is going to be uh, below the OES. Um, but with Lyceum, you can actually have quite an accurate prediction as to what the maximum directivity is possible to be in any particular direction. Um, and you can also go further than that to start to evaluate your radar system for potential radiation hazards, um, in addition to the coverage and what different, what different um, near field things might present scattering risks and distort your overall pattern as you start to steer beams around. Um, also, I did mention the beamforming architecture. It makes it quite easy within Lysenium to look at the effects of different beamforming architectures on the overall um, steerability and achievable gain in any particular direction of the antenna array, whether or not you're looking at uh, something that's static with an illuminating horn, single channel beamforming with columns or subarrays, or even down to fully digital. Um, what the effects of each one of those different architectures are going to be on the far field performance. And beyond that, you can also look at things as granular as the resolution of phase shifters. So this is actually the achieved directivity in any particular command angle for that X-band array on the UAS that you just saw. And here we've got uh, just an elevation equals zero slice um, for different phase shifter resolution. And what you can see is, for me, one of the useful things about steering efficiency product is that um, because this two-bit resolution phase shifter is actually doing a pretty poor job, um, it's got a lower uh, forward directivity than otherwise it should be able to achieve. And so the steering efficiency is relatively high because more of this pattern is within 3 dBs. Um, but you look at the steering efficiency product and you can see that there is this upwards trend as you get increased resolution on those phase shifters. Effectively, it all starts coming up a bit more um, while, while the steering efficiency is starting to recover by the time you're up to 8 bits. But it's a very small gain from 6-bit uh, resolution to 8-bit resolution. So the idea was to allow or, or look at what the effects were for any particular antenna array. And more than things like phase shift resolution, what is the effect of having a integrated planar array versus a conformal one or versus a conformal and sparse antenna array in terms of the uh, gain in any particular direction? And so I modeled uh, using my CDM. This is the, uh, the, the tip end, I suppose, of the building I work in in Bristol called the Merchant Ventures building. And it has this rather nice conformal surface here that looks very nice. But we had the question, well, if we were to put a 5G base station there, would there be a way to integrate it into the built environment in a way as to make it invisible? And what effects would different choices have on the overall pattern? And what we found is that with the sparse array, you could reach a much wider uh, command angle without any degradation in the directivity. And the effect of that is you have this rather more messy pattern but it is much more steerable in terms of the azimuth. Um, it only actually drops off down here because the, it was spread to near these columns. And so they were, were assumed to have a bit more of an impact on the overall pattern. But it's, it's an interesting thing to have to play with. And it only takes, for raise this size, it's milliseconds to do the actual uh, simulations. This is one of the examples I did a bit more validation on, and I showed this at the radar conference in October. This is the Sea Searcher radar off a Sea King uh, with a quoted gain of 34 dBs. Um, just doing an aperture projection of the reflector itself, um, it has a maximum gain figure of, I think it was about 38 dBs, uh, but that's assuming that you can turn it into a phased array. That's obviously not what it is. And so just meshing it as a statically ex excited uh, horn and reflector and using Lysenium to then model that with a, a new uh, point sampling algorithm, I was able to compare it to CST. And you see there's 
You can see some of the same features, but it is a lot more noisy. And I'll get onto why it's a bit more noisy in a second. But you can see the main features in the cross-polar and then in the copolar are all in the right place. It's just there's this a noise that really makes you think, what on earth is going on there? Now, it, you can actually see what's going on there here. So this is all the scaffing points um, in relatively bright colors on the reflector. And what you can see is this kind of random uh, sampling. And what this is, is I was trying out a new sampling algorithm to try and have a, an easy time for the users of deciding how they would mesh uh, different reflectors in the environment. This is Poisson disk sampling. Um, unfortunately for this particular example, the Poisson disk algorithm was not producing a very regular point structure and it undersampled the edges compared to the reflecting face. Um, hence why the, it was producing that kind of structure. But the overall agreement was on the order of uh, minus 15 dB RMS error between the two, which is quite good. Um, and also the main beam was in the right location and remeshing it with the appropriate um, or rather with a more regular point distribution on the reflector um, should give a much more uh, agreement between CST and LICNEM, although I haven't actually got around to doing that myself. One example of a much more regular meshing structure for a reflector radar is from the Fairy Gannet AEW3, uh, much more pokey radar itself. Um, and making a model of that reflector, um, it suggests a maximum directivity of 30 dBi. When it's put into Lysenium with the platform model, uh, with that much more regular point meshing structure, you can see it's a lot cleaner in terms of the, the contours. Um, the reflector is only about 330 points for the power bolt reflector function, but I've actually written since doing the, um, the C searcher model, I've written a parabolic reflector mesh function, which both produces the nice uh, parabola, but also meshes it in a much more regular and structured way. And then once you've got that in the model, you can rotate the reflector around within the model space to start looking at what the scanning performance is actually going to look like in the presence of the um, gannet itself. And you can just look around as the uh, reflector is steered across through hole 360. You can see the effect of the wings and the tail assembly. And um, yeah, so these are elevation plane slices. In azimuth plane, it doesn't alter very much um, at elevation equals zero, uh, but you can see it all is uh, changing quite a bit with elevation in the elevation plane. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a rather cleaner example. And it's, I think, an interesting look at the difference in sampling algorithms for the way in which a computational problem is going to be meshed by the computer. Um, I thought, what's one of the bigger radars I'm familiar with? Um, just using publicly available information on an ANSPY 1D. It's quite an impressive route, I must say. Over 4,000 elements in each array, and it's got four of them distributed around that main superstructure. And of course, an aperture projection on um, this thing gives you quite a close agreement between that maximum directivity and uh, their sighted gain. And also it starts to give you an idea as to the, the reasons why they're spaced around the superstructure like that. However, when you start to beamform it around, and this is, you know, I don't know whether it's particularly accurate or not, because I don't know exactly the arrangement of those elements within those phased rays, but just assuming a regular rectangular structure, um, you can start to predict the beamform performance for any particular angle. And also the effects on of those scatterers out on the ship itself on the, the beam pattern as it scans around in azimuth. And this does take a little longer, but then it's something in the order of 16,000 elements all being beam formed around. So it's uh, not exactly a small problem. Um, another example I did fairly recently is having a look at satellite based passive radar. Um, inspired somewhat by uh, Hughes research, which I've always liked keeping up on. 
um, but funded by Sprint in collaboration with Cardiff Metropolitan University and for Earth Intelligence and a company called Polycord. Um, we're having a look at the effects of Starlink as an illuminator of choice, because um, Spire and a number of others have done GPS-based passive radar for SAR and also for monitoring the atmosphere. But Starlink is a lot higher frequency, transmits at a higher power, and is transmitting multiple channels over two gigahertz uh, downlink allocation. And each one of those is 250 megahertz wide. So it's a significantly attractive, and also they have over 3,000 satellites and are at the moment on course to have over 7,000 satellites within the next five years. So it's a significant source of RF illumination energy. And it's, I think I'm right in saying transmitting in QAM. So it's got a constant amplitude, but is reasonably recoverable in terms of the uh, correlation function. Um, so just with an analytical formula uh, drawn from uh, Hugh Griffiths' book on passive radar. You can predict to receive power in terms of dB watts per four kilohertz of about minus 90 to minus 95, um, which isn't especially great, but it's not too bad either. When you run it through Lycinium for the five closest Starlink satellites and a satellite receiver, you get about minus 80 to minus 90 dB watts over four kilohertz, which was a nice confirmation. Um, just for a single channel, this does imply that you can, if you can do coherent integration, which is by no means a given, but over relatively short timescales, this implies a very high signal to noise ratio is possible for a really a quite um, reasonable size of receiver antenna on a satellite in similar low Earth orbits. So that was a quite an interesting outcome for me, but also meant that when combined with things like folium, you can make much more, I think, engaging plots on the motion of these satellites. So these are the Starlink satellites, five closest to a target area of interest, which is where the London Wind Farm Array is. And then you can see this is the uh, notional receive satellite here. Effectively, I've just replaced one of Starlink's own satellites in one of their trains to uh, just as a reasonable big example orbit. Um, this particular example is available on the website in a limited fashion. So if you have Folium and you want to try it out, you can look at uh, satellite to ground to satellite propagation losses and things like that yourself. Um, we also did a look at a notional conformal antenna array on a marine platform for a, a submersible vessel that could do sonar imaging on the base of wind farms and then could surface and use a dorsal antenna array to try and image the above the sea portions of the, the wind turbines, which was, I thought, quite an, an interesting idea for a kind of a combined sensor system, because it would be able to use this array to not only do imaging, but then could um, reconfigure and use it to connect to the Starlink system itself to relay all its information back. Um, and for that receiver, which was a lot smaller, um, the analytical prediction was about minus 105 dB watts per four kilohertz. But then when you integrate over that 250 megahertz channel, um, A, Lysinium was agreeing with that being roughly the expected reception. Uh, but when you integrate over the whole channel, you get, again, um, significant possibilities in terms of the signals and noise. I mean, I'm thinking that coherent integration is the challenging aspect, um, but we were just using the simplest case for a uh, notional radar receiver. Um, something I'm working on right now is looking at modeling uh, cooperative UAS and uh, cooperative radar. Um, so I'm just going to quickly zip through it because I know there's not much time left. Um, just looking to detect a target that is the, the same type of UAS itself at a range of 2000 meters. Uh, using a very simplistic transmit pulse. It's just a linear chirp over 20 nanoseconds at power of one watt. Um, and then doing frequency domain angle of arrival using each uh, antenna array, uh, correctly predicting the location or rather the bearing of the target. 
and then looking at things like received power versus beam forming angle or a cross correlation function on the transmit pulse. And then multilateration. And really, for me, the interesting bit is the opportunity to work in uh, looking at waveforms and, and, and radar uh, reception, because Lysenium is handling the propagation, the polarization of the antenna arrays, and lets you really concentrate on this bit. And so I was putting together this example to demonstrate, well, actually, if your research is in waveforms and in radar behavior, you can use Lysenium to have a very accurate model of the propagation and scattering of a realistic target, and then be able to concentrate on this area and be able to present a whole coherent piece of work. Um, yeah, this was one of the notional kind of suggestions of maybe you could have UAS fly in formation to conserve fuel. Um, and what effect would that have on the overall detection range of the UAS? And future developments. Uh, we've received funding to put it on a much more systematic basis, at least as far as the programming goes. I've done all the programming so far, but we're going to be hiring a dedicated uh, research software engineer to move it to a much more scalable computer architecture. Right now it's single GPU, but by the end of the year, the aim is to have it have a CPU mode, which is scalable between small laptops for setting up small problems or just visualizing things, all the way to uh, multi-core high-performance computing clusters, and also putting in support for Doppler, something notably is absent at the moment, um, but I'm working on it at the moment. Um, but also scaling the whole thing up so it can handle much bigger problems. How much bigger, you may ask? Well, if you're interested in absolutely enormous antenna arrays, billions of antenna elements over a kilometer in diameter, then my next seminar on the 17th of March is going to be an interesting one. Have you got any questions or can I go over any for it?